Naomi. And this is the Espace Trico podcast. We're from a local yarn shop in Montreal. And yeah, we've got lots of cool sort of spring and summer yarns to show you. Let's get right into it. It doesn't quite feel like the season for it, but by the time these things get off your needles, it'll be the perfect time to wear them. So I always feel like March, early April is where I start feeling like I want to knit summery things just to have them ready in time. It's also, I feel responsible for the fact that it snowed earlier today because I keep trying to put away my winter coat. <laughs> and every time I do it, it snows again. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta learn my lesson and stop doing this to everybody. Yeah, yeah. It was quite a nice weekend. We had some sun, but uh, back to yeah. gray. But soon enough, I saw like crocuses and little yeah. snowdrops pushing out of the soil. And that's always like, just a little bit longer. Yeah, not long now. Um, but where you are, maybe it's completely different and already glorious spring. I was in Portland, Oregon last weekend um, and saw all the cherry blossoms starting to come out on the trees. And that was just so refreshing. So it is that out may, there. Okay, that may explain also why you're like, yeah. you're there before I am. Like, I'm definitely still like, woolly wools, please. Well, I'm wearing woolly wools. <laughs> yes, me too. But I'm also, I remember how I get every year in like June where it's not quite so hot that the only thing you can wear is a bathing suit but you have to go out in the world so you have to put on a t-shirt and be mad about it all day <laughs> um but when there is that sweet spot of like you can wear a hand knit in cotton or linen and i get to that point and i'm like oops march naomi didn't make any <laughs> <laughs> bad past naomi uh well I, around that time of year i'm still wearing mohair so yeah. but i like i like like summer mohair where it's still breezy out and it's not really sticky yet yeah i know not everybody will wear mohair yeah, in the spring it, and summer but i do it's still pretty fibrous if even if it's not too warm i find it's the actual hair of the thing yeah but, it needs to be a yeah. loose fit i think for yeah. that to work at all anyways we're getting ahead of ourselves <laughs> um let's uh why don't we start with what we're wearing well that segues pretty well because i actually am wearing mohair and i'm wearing mohair how i really love to wear it which is just over a tank top like nothing else underneath because I really do love the feeling of it against my skin but I think I cap out in about uh what 15 to 18 degrees no way really oh I'm gonna go to like 22 23 yeah. before I take my mohair off yeah so tell us about this I remember when you were so, working on it yeah I showed this last time as the uh practically useless store sample <laughs> <laughs> in terms of it being a pattern that was not in English and a yarn that we did not have and another yarn that we did not carry but one of those things two of those things i think are rectified because we did restock on knitting for olive merino i used the color unicorn purple and i was also trying to make use of a mohair silk mohair blend of our bliss mohair from bon Tricot. um and i was testing a new color because springtime new palette it's always fun to develop new things and um I think it shall be coming to yarn shelves near you pretty soon because I really do love it. It's a great color and I'm super yeah. excited for the direction it's taking. Um, but then, and this was called the Pizza Blues. Pizza Blues, yes. Thank you, Steph, for reminding me to give the names of the patterns I knit. <laughs> it is a Knitting for Olive design. Um, I made pretty good use of, as I said on the last episode, I'll just recap quickly if you didn't watch, it's a very standard raglan construction, it doesn't even have short rows, so between my knowledge of having knitted a lot of raglan sweaters, and I really just wanted to use it to, to follow the chart and to avoid having to map this type of lace onto a separate type of raglan, I think a classic me, I did not follow the instructions for the sleeves. I don't improv think I even, sleeves. Improv sleeves, I don't think I even looked at the instructions for the sleeves because I couldn't understand them um but i did some decreases at a pretty regular rate trying to work it into the lace itself because obviously the repeats get in the way yeah if you are knitting a lace sweater i highly recommend looking at the actual instructions for the sleeves because the designer has done that work for you why waste that <laughs> <laughs> um but your reasoning is that you didn't have the english pattern i didn't have the english pattern and i sort of just went with the kind of fit i wanted which is oversized um, not too deep in the armhole but I wanted the sleeves to be uh, a little bit balloony without being that exaggerated balloon shape which I think the pattern itself is designed with a more exaggerated balloon sleeve but this color is going to be a little stronger I think in real life just a little more oomph to it and I will show you I've put it on happy four ply our sock yarn so 
let's see if I can get this to focus. This is the fun thing about, uh, we got a new, we have a new camera. So, so I think maybe it needs to take up the whole screen. There we go. There we go. Beautiful. So I this left is some silence there <laughs> so you can clip around it if you need. Okay. <laughs> So obviously the colors come out slightly different on different bases, but I think this is, it gives a really good idea of where Naomi's taking this, this color, which is this sort of almost neutral, mm -hmm. um, sort of purpley gray, which I think is super useful aside from like the usual, there's a, you know, cold gray and mm. a Blue warm gray, gray yeah. and they get this purpley gray. And I feel like it's very, very, it is the moment, <laughs> this kind of purpley tone right now. Yeah. So I'm also wearing something that Naomi knit. This is um, her beautiful academic vest by Skein Deer. Um, so you made some changes to this too. Originally, it's not a steeked vest, right? It is steeked because oh. you steek the armholes. Right. So um, if you take on this project, you will need to steek the armholes unless you re-engineer it to knit them flat. Um, I also steeked the front. So um, it has these gorgeous Pigeon Wishes buttons here, um, which Naomi originally had different buttons, but they were hers. So when she gifted me this beautiful vest, she's like, however, I'd like button the buttons back. back. They were my red <laughs> buttons. So I changed them up for these beautiful Pigeon, Wish Pigeon Wishes buttons. And I wear this all the time. And I have started to get into this like <laughs> power clashing thing where I'm really enjoying like my plaid shirts with with my uh, cool vest. I really love it. It's like dark academia, but also cowgirl. Which I think might be my whole personality now. Like, it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm really, I'm also like been, we've been both listened to the Articles of Interest podcast. Uh, we'll link that. It's really fascinating. Uh, they just did a series all about American Ivy, which is basically prep clothing, mm -hmm. sort of the history of it. And as I was listening to it, and it's cool because you're listening instead of looking. I think if I had been actually looking at the photographs, I'd be like, oh, so dated. But in my mind, I started to get this idea of like how I could take these sort of elements of sort of prep style mm -hmm. and put them with my knits and my cowboy aesthetic. And so this is what's happening. And I'm really happy with it. So this is something I wear all the time. And it's just, it's so interesting because I would never have chosen these colors. And yet, I reach for it all the time. So I think it's a good lesson to sort of like broaden your mind, and especially with color work where it's gonna just come together in a very different way than it does sort of in a pile of yarn. Yeah, color work's a really fun chance to, to throw some colors in there that you wouldn't necessarily wear in a whole big mass or in like a monotone garment, for example. This came up, I think, on, um, on Instagram a couple posts ago at one point I posted like a really beautiful red I think it was um oh yeah because knitting for olive came out with these gorgeous oh, the red and pinks bright tones um and somebody said you know I love those colors but I'd never wear them I don't look good in them or something like that and little glimpses of color are where it it's a great way to sort of practice starting to throw those colors into your wardrobe that you really love but you're maybe not there yet in terms of wearing the whole outfit um and just sort of get like warm up to wearing those colors. Yeah. And I do think that, I know that color seasons are really coming back in again. I just keep getting Instagram posts about color seasons. Yeah, yeah, the I'm an autumn That's thing. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And I don't quite know what I am, yet I really head down the path of if you love a color, you're gonna love wearing it and people are gonna see that. You're gonna be radiant and happy because you're wearing a color that you love. Agreed. Um, so while I don't usually ever wear purple, I'm feeling great in lilac. Yeah, it looks awesome on you. It's Thanks. so elegant. Yeah, I'm yeah, really it's beautiful. It. But I know one of the reasons that um, this vest came to me is that you felt that this um, the shoulder was a little deep for you and it didn't fit mm. you the way you wanted. Uh, I had also knit this with more ease than recommended because there's a really there was a really beautiful finished object on the Ravelry projects where um, the knitter was wearing it boxy and oversized without being a cardigan, and I loved that fit. Um, for a sweater vest and for what I was intending to style it with um, and in the end just making that change by just knitting a size extra big for me didn't get that result for yeah. me and it was hard to see because I couldn't try it on until steeped. I cut it open so um, but luckily you have a yeah. broad-shouldered friend who appreciates you that's it yeah, I love it. I wear it all the time. And I love to see it being worn because it would just be in my closet. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah, well, you keep giving me your knits. <laughs> unsatisfactory projects. I just would have it taking up space, gathering dust at home. And I love to see you wearing it. It's truly an honor. 
Um, I love this. I mean, basically I can just knit store samples, you knit me clothes. This works out great for me. So I like it. So I used seven contrast colors in this because I was using the leftovers from the Scaries Mittens by Marie Wallen that we made as a store sample that I knit. I loved that pattern. Um, we've made a number of kits for it. Maybe you picked one up. If you did, you can put your leftovers in something like this. There's lots left over in those uh, little balls of Jameson's Shetland Spindrift. The original pattern itself calls for four contrast colors. Um, so I had lots of fun on um, chart software, basically redoing the chart with seven. Um, I use this one I've mentioned before, stitchfiddle.com. We'll put it down below. It's free to create up to 10 charts and it's really fun for just putting your own colors, imagining your own colors and plotting them out for any color work chart. So that's it. I would really recommend doing that if you're making any changes. It's helpful if you're using a different color palette, but especially if you're adding colors or trying to, you know, save a little bit of money if the yardage works out to use three instead of four. Um, you can play with it there too and, uh, and figure yeah. that out. Great result. I love it. Yeah. Well, hello, cowgirl. I know, right? <laughs> um, so this is my work in progress. Uh, this is called The Cowgirl Crop by Morale Mokri. And um, I think the last time we uh, showed this, I was still in this world up here. So I've gotten pretty much to the end of the body. I am still on, so like I'm maybe an inch from casting off. So I'm not quite as cropped as the original, but it's not long either. Mm. And this is a case of literally trying to get this to go with an outfit, which mm -hmm. I don't do enough of, where it's like, I've gotten a couple of these cute little shirts and I, I envision wearing it over them. Perfect. So I wanna leave just enough that like, you see the little plaid yeah. coming out at the bottom. And I am gonna add sleeves. So this is yeah. originally a t-shirt and I am gonna knit sleeves down to about here so that, yeah, same thing. You can see the little plaid coming out. Yeah. And my plan is that I'm going to use duplicate stitch to put a boot on one sleeve and a hat on the other one. That's really cute. Because why not? Uh, I'm really enjoying it now that I've gotten through this section. I admit this is always like where things kind of fall apart for me, where I'm like, <laughs> can't handle oh, so much stockinette. Um, and I also this little detail here that's so from sweet. here, it's not in the original pattern. Okay. Oh, okay. But, you know, I was thinking about the way that like often when you're working with a pattern, it is a, an act of collaboration and there's no way like this doesn't exist without this beautiful pattern. Um, and taking these little elements and deciding to put them in different places, I feel like I'm in conversation a little bit uh, with the original pattern in a way that makes me really happy. And also that I'm like, I wanna wear it with all my cowboy boots. So I'm really thinking about, well, what outfits do I wear my boots with? Um, and for me, it's these sort of plaid shirts and jeans. So yeah, I want the sleeves. Uh, maybe I'll improvise yeah. them. I'll take the, a page <laughs> from Naomi's book and just improvise my sleeves. Well, if the pattern doesn't have them, you'll have to. Yeah, I know, but I could go and find yeah. something written, I'm sure, at this gauge. Yeah. But instead, maybe I'm gonna wing it. I think you want, uh given that you're thinking already that you're going to be wearing it over these shirts, you've got a sleeve under there. So you definitely want some room. Yeah. But I think you also don't want it to balloon. If no. Anything, you want it to be a little bit wide. So yeah, a little bit. So that it room for this fabric here. Yeah, I think I'm going for like quite a classic yeah. uh, sleeve fit where probably I won't do a ton of decreases, mm -hmm. but I will do some and, you know, maybe knit a couple inches then start yeah. and keep them nicely spaced. And I'll do a little cuff measurement on something that I like the fit of so that I know what I'm trying to get down to. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking like this is the season for these kind of DK weight sweaters. Uh, it's perfect. I'm really excited about it. I will, in fact, um, I think I'll keep wearing this through our whip yeah, discussion and then I'll change back in. But uh, well, that's comfortable. So that's what I'm working on. It's it's a I'm doing some swatching and designing as well, but stuff that I'm not ready to show. So I'm sorry that I don't have as much to bring as usual, but at least it's a really cheerful one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, and I brought something to show just for like, if you're ever thinking like, what do I do with my bits and bobs that are left over? So yeah, you were talking last year, last uh, episode about how little it actually took for all these little bits. Yeah, so I knit this, uh, I designed this uh, sweater called the Breton Spice. Um, a number of years ago. And these are all the same yarns basically are in here. I have a new MC. This is my Julie Asselin Les UDK and Naturel. Um, but so this is a lot of um, yarns by Kindred Red, which were like beautiful festival finds that I really wanted to use together. So even though there's definitely a similar color palette here, I think 
you can really see that, you know, you can take those leftovers and those little bits and put them in a completely different design and no one's gonna be like, oh, isn't that just like your other sweater? And, and I, I just wanna show this closer because it's so much fun, this stitch pattern. And again, we, there, there we go. So it's combining color work, bobbles and sort of dip stitches and- But there's so much texture in it. Mm -hmm. It's really, um, it's a challenging knit because uh, you have to pay a lot of attention. There's also like short rows are buried in between each little repeat, so but it like was that. super duper fun to make and it's really fun to wear. And now I'll have another thing to have, <laughs> to have these precious yarns in. So yeah, you know, never be, you know, keep those little bits, even if they're this, like some of these were like little tiny mm -hmm. bits and they still came in handy, so. Well, yeah, the, um, the academic vest, I was just looking when I, just to go back to it quickly, when I was looking to make sure I had the information correct to tell you all about the colors, um, the fourth color only used between 14 and 30 yards. Yeah. That's actually barely, that's not even 10 grams. So it's, it's worth keeping these tiny little bits. There's a sewing, um, blogger that I followed who always would say if something was bigger than the size of her hand, a little leftover, she'd keep it. That's a good rule of thumb. Yeah. So I think hand it's, yeah. For sewing. Oh, I'm going to use that. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I feel really bad throwing tiny, tiny bits away. But you know, it that. makes sense. Like if yeah. it, if it's big enough that like you put your hand over it and it doesn't cover it, she's like, I'll keep that. So I think with yarn balls, I'm sort of like, you know, if if it can fit through there, I might be like, okay. But if it's bigger than this yeah. hole, I'm gonna keep it. Yeah, and I'll use it for something. Cool, good uh, tactic. Yeah. So what are you knitting? Um, so I am knitting something I'm really excited about. I cast on as soon as we got this eagerly awaited yarn delivery on Friday. This is the Marika sweater from a longer back Anna, oops, the yarn is stuck to it. And it's knitted along a back Anna DK, which we are now carrying along with the mohair and merino. Can yeah. I? Yeah, I will hold this. this. Yeah. So you may know a longer back Anna primarily for the knitting designs. Um, she's behind the immensely popular Trescal sweater, um, which is a free top down raglan sweater with beautiful little shoulder detailing. It's free on Ravelry in English. Et en français, tous ces patrons sont aussi en français. Um, and she now lives in the UK, and I should say she and a team, because we've been communicating with some great people from her team, are making this beautiful set of yarns, three yarn lines. And so the same colors, it's the same palette across three yarn lines, a fingering weight merino, a DK weight merino, and a silk mohair blend. So they're all from traceable back to the farm, mulesing free facilities, which is better welfare for the animals involved, uh, in this case, merino sheep. Um, a Rico tax and reach compliant dye processes and production, all of these good buzzwords that we're starting to learn more about as we increase our, um, our supplier base and find more yarns and keep learning about about new ways of processing. Yeah, and a lot of times, you know, when we get messages from suppliers who have these things, it's like, oh, that sounds great. And then taking them time to actually go research what mm -hmm. it means. I think we're learning a lot and definitely yeah. what we, we were really impressed by the depth of the explanations yeah. from Alonga Vegana about the sourcing of their yarn. So we feel super confident about it and it's beautiful. It's gorgeous. So a lot of what those production acronyms mean relate both to uh, labor conditions in factories and also like chemicals used both in dyeing and spinning processes. So that it, it covers a range of, of processing that happens uh, from sheep to skein or ball in this case. And so this is the DK weight, which I'm using for this sweater. This is the color Jade um, and it's so plump. It's so nicely spun. It's a three ply. So if, you, if you're somebody who has a tendency to find that yarn split while you're knitting, um, some DKs you might find are more splitty because often DK is built from just adding more plies, more tiny strands of yarn that are spun together to build up that thickness into a DK. Whereas this is a three ply, that means only three strands are in it. And I think most people would find this just you wouldn't have any issues with splitting at all. It is, it just feels so nice. And you were saying too that like the combination of the nice Addy needle mm -hmm. with this yarn has that really satisfying, excellent mix. I just found it just wants to knit up evenly. I'm really happy with my stockinette, for example, um, how it's knitting in this. And usually I don't knit color work with superwash yarns because I find it, it, I mean, I'm not the only one, this is a common, thing that you'll find if you look into colorwork tips and tricks. Um, 
non-super wash yarns can be better because they're stickier, they don't slip around on each other and they can help you keep your tension even. And I avoid knitting super wash yarns in color work for this reason, they're a bit slippery. And while this isn't quite as even as if I were knitting an untreated yarn, it doesn't have that more slippery feel of superwash. It is machine washable treated, um, and yet it still feels natural, woolly, and I would say still soft enough for, for the majority of Oh, skins. absolutely. Yeah, this, it feels lovely. Mm -hmm. I would absolutely, I mean, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> really good. Yeah. Um, so basically we have, is it, it's 15 a, a 15 colors? palette. A 15 color palette. 15 color palette. And three I, of them are new yeah. and three other colors I saw they developed in the autumn. So that's really exciting to see how much they're putting behind these yarns and coming up with, with colors so regularly. I'm really excited for where this will go. Um, 15 doesn't sound like many, but they're really well curated. It doesn't feel like there's anything missing from this. Well, there, and we've talked yeah. about like, when, a, when a palette is that well curated too, it really helps you as a knitter any colors from this palette are going to work together like you don't have to worry too much about oh i want to do something with stripes mm. but is that color not going to fit like if you are buying from this palette it's going to work yeah. together there's nothing that stands out and there are some really gorgeous deep tones as well as really delicate pastels so there's really something for everybody um i'm really excited to keep knitting with this yarn um and i'm just maybe one evening away from finishing this, which is exciting. I'm going to put it through the washing machine um, to have a sample in store so that we can show people what it's like when it's machine washed. So I'll update on Instagram there um, about how that goes. Yeah, it's super cute. And I haven't shown the mohair yet. So there's also, yeah, a merino um, fingering weight, which is comparable to knitting for olive in um, thickness, I think. But again, a bit of a different texture. I can't quite pinpoint exactly how. Um, Maybe it feels a little plumper. Well, and what's interesting yeah. is the DK is quite light. Like mm. I would say, I definitely say it's more on the lighter end of a DK. You know, 22 stitches is going to be perfect for this. 20 this is probably is the limit. 20 might be the limit for a shawl, for example. But I think for a sweater, I would knit it at 22, maybe 23. I'm thinking maybe my next project in it for myself would be the Helix cardigan um, by Marianne Meunier, Meunier, excuse me, which is... Uh, pattern developed in collaboration with Fabienne May, uh, originally stranded, but I think it'd be really lovely at 23 stitches in this DK just to give it some density and structure. Yeah. And then there's mohair, of course, as well, because we had to, we had <laughs> to get all of them. And I think this this mohair would be absolutely beautiful with, with any stranding project. It would match up really beautifully with any of our other yarns, anything you have at home. Um, I love just that that nuance of like picking the right mohair for your project, I just love having as many options as possible. You know, Knitting for Olive has some beautiful pale pinks as well, but not like this pale pink. And sometimes you just want that slight, yeah, something you can't put your finger on just still makes all the difference. But I also do appreciate that these are perfectly color matched. So if that's something that holds you up a little bit where you're like, ooh, I don't know if this mohair is gonna go yes. with, you know, the nice thing about shopping from this palette is knowing that you are going to get that perfect match. Totally, especially when you're shopping online and we understand how that can be trickier. And I've just realized this, along with Arcana Selection, is the only option we have in store for that perfect color matching between a mohair and a DK. That's true. Yeah, because while well, Knitting for yeah. Olive does have it with the um, Yeah, we have Knitting for fingering. Olive, fingering weight merino, cotton merino. Those match perfectly with the silk and mohair, but we don't have a Knitting for Olive DK. That's so. true. There you go. Yeah, really good thing Sorted. to have. Sorted. So, uh, yeah, really happy with this. Excited to finish it. But that's my main whip at the moment, really, aside from, yeah, some nebulous design projects floating around. So, um, going back to what we were talking about right in the intro, summer yarns and spring knitting, um, should we talk about that? Yeah, we have so many great yarns already in stock and also stuff that's on its way. Um, so we're going to do like a little flyover. A pricey. A pricey. <laughs> My <laughs> husband makes fun of me for using the word pricey too much. Let's do a pricey. It's funny because I basically never hear you say pricey. Well, it was like a phase. Does that okay. ever happen to you where like a word comes I into your vocab so. and you're like, i got to use this all the time and then you so. get over it? Yeah. Um, it was probably in a book I was reading. <laughs> anyway, I'm a very suggestible. Let's do a pricey. Of 
summer yarn. So um, we'll talk more about uh, this one later when we actually receive our annual restock, which is coming in um, April, April, May. May. Yeah, They're always a bit nebulous, but when it gets here, we're always super excited. This is Petit Lin Plus, our house sport weight linen. Um, there is also a lace weight blend called Petit Lin. So uh, when you are shopping for it, pay attention to that plus. Yeah. Um, because the lace weight, really quite different from the sport weight, but you can hold a double yeah. and it's up similar. Um, so we just thought we'd share a few really bright colors because it's getting summery and then a quick little one skein project that yeah, has been really is, popular for this yarn. Yeah, it's this one is a classic that comes back year after year. It's called the Eileen bag and it's a really simple knit. This uses just one skein and it's super practical. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of those things, you know, it folds up to nothing and then you go to the market, you go to the beach, you know, it's classic and yeah. uh, really fun to knit and yeah. just one skein gets you there. And we have all sorts of bright, fun colors. Um, if you check our designs on Ravelry too, there are lots that are made with this. Um, and I think there's there's quite a lot of pattern inspiration if you check on Ravelry, if that's how you use Ravelry. Um, but we will be coming back and letting you know all about this once we have more in stock of each color. We're quite well stocked up, but some colors we only just have a few and not enough for, for a garment. A garment. So, so that's why we thought we'll show a little yeah. something. If you're just like, can't wait to get some linen on your needles. That's it. We can't talk about summer yarns without talking about Petit Lin, Petit Lin Plus. There we go. Uh, next up, Biobalance yeah. from BC Garn. This is a yarn I especially love. Um, Me in fact, too. of the three samples we're going to show you, two of them are my designs. <laughs> so it's, it's my go-to sort of uh, warm weather knitting. Uh, it's a fingering to sport weight. I would say it's like a heavy fingering sport weight. Yeah. 55% uh, cotton. Or am I getting that mixed up? 55% wool. 45% cotton. I always want to call it a 50-50 because it feels like it to yeah. me, but I guess it's a little heavier on the wool side. They recommend 25 stitches in four inches on the label, but I like it looser. Yeah. It's dense that way. Mona knit it held double. I really love yeah. it held double. It is really great. Um, so this is an oldie but a goodie. Oh, wait, I'll wait till you do that. Uh, <laughs> this is the Sanctuary Tea. This was originally in Pom Pom magazine a couple of years ago. And... Um, this is a fun one because I it's knit inside out because there's a lot of pearl in this pattern. So you knit it with the um, the knit side or the, the stockinette side facing you and then the idea is that you turn it inside out. But a lot of people don't. I think they just skip that part of the direction <laughs> and, and wear it, it the other way. But you know what, that's, that's cool, cool too. Um, but I was sort of inspired by domed ceilings. Mm. That was part of the call was about tiles and okay. sort of repeating motifs. That was a beautiful issue in this. Yeah. I love how it comes back year after year. That's the thing with summer knits yeah. in general, I find they do have a lot of, of staying power. So this is a, the a BC Garn Biobalance. This is a four skeins and this is size two. So it's meant to be worn with quite a bit of ease. And we've had it on a hanger too. So I think when you knit it, the neckline isn't that wide. That's true. Although also I'm, a I'm a loose cast on okay. person. So I have also responded to quite a number of e emails over the years about this. Of like, you know, if you tend to cast on tightly, there is a little increase. You can kind of skip it and just cast on to the next one if you want that wide neckline. Okay. But yeah, I'm, I'm real loose in my cast on. <laughs> uh, here is another store sample we have that is just like, it's always popular every year. This is the Bolin tea. I'm always throwing this on when the AC gets too high in here. Yeah. This is by Leela Raven. And uh, again, size two. Size two and how many? Uh, three skeins. Three skeins. Um, and I love this construction. Chloe knit this back in the day. Yeah. It's uh, knit this way, or um, then this way. And I think it meets in the middle. Yeah, I it's think. really, it's, it's not out from the middle? No, it meets in the middle. No, it's out from the middle. Let's see yeah. if we can see. See that stitch there? Yeah. And then that way, yeah. yeah. So it goes out from the middle. So four pieces stitched together it's a great easy easy to wear shape yeah. super Fantastic. elegant it's got this drop shoulder but there's no seam at the shoulder to to hold it in place so it really just falls very elegantly and then this one is from you. last fall i guess <laughs> or last spring sorry so this is a free pattern in nitty it's called the mcvee it was a little bit inspired by christine mcvee 
uh, from Fleetwood Mac because there's this fabulous photograph of her on one of their albums where she's wearing sort of something like this and is in profile and just looks amazing. <laughs> um, so this also is like a, this is a drop shoulder style. So it's knit flat and seamed. And I even used my sewing machine <laughs> to put in my sleeves. You don't have to, it's easier. You could just pick them up and, uh, and sew them in properly. But uh, you know, it's really, this was actually inspired by Mona. The late, the... Putting the eyelets yeah. in the body and doing the, the pearl side out. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're someone who overheats a little bit, if you, you know, you find that you're always hot, I find this a really nice way to add a little bit of breathability totally. to something. Especially when it has that wool content as well, as well, it'll just extend the season for wearing it. Yeah. So you can yeah. put something underneath or you can have your tank top totally. like you're wearing today, right? And uh, yeah. And if you get warm throughout the rest of the year, BioBalance is also a really great fingering weight option for year round sweaters if you tend to overheat yeah. in the colder months as well um and because this is knit flap you're not it's reverse stockinette through the body right but yeah so you're not purling every not row purling or every row. no yeah. not at all so that's one of our favorites another favorite alba She's like, I can't believe this is one of my favorites. I've never been, like, I've really always struggled to knit with plant-based fibers. I think uh, the way I tension my yarn, I often really need the elasticity. But I find that at this 100% cotton, uh, it, it has the elasticity I need mm -hmm. to be able to actually work with it. So this is um, the Antioch blanket that Amalia and I worked on together. Uh, you know, it's super it's simple. Awesome. It's just stripes and garter, mm -hmm. but then it has these fun little tassels. I was inspired by sort of the Turkish towels. Yeah. Um, these are really fun to make. You kind of just twist them around. And I love the dimensions that you've brought in with the stripes too. Like yeah. just playing with the the balance. Um, there's yeah, so a little much bit you thing. can do with stripes. And then this wider section at the end, there's yeah. just like... It was definitely, I looked at some examples of sort of those... Turkish towel yeah. style and was like, how do they balance out the stripes? Yeah. And I really found that like, this was quite common. So this is a really clean, smooth knitting, mercerized cotton. Um, and we just, we decided to just go for it this summer and get all the colors. It has a really great palette, like 40 something colors. Uh, so we've got all of them, at least that the supplier had in stock. So you've got tons of options for really bright knits, as well as um, beautiful pastels, pastels and neutrals. It would be really great crochet cotton for toys, for bralettes. Um, it's a uh, robust fingering weight for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm just, yeah, it really feels great. Like yeah. I would love to have a sweater in this or a t-shirt in this. It's got drape, we, it's got bounce. It's really yeah. a fabulous yarn. We don't always think of 100% cotton yarns as like adult garment yarns. Um, yeah, we all wear 100% like cotton t-shirts. Uh, 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 united history of uh, knitting dishcloths to learn <laughs> <laughs> to learn how to knit uh, maybe at least drove me a little bit off 100% moisturized cotton yarns. Moisturized just meaning it's like you've got that smoother, shinier feel to it. Although this one does have a matte it's, effect. It's much less so than say like the, yeah. um, the butterfly sure. uh, mercerized cotton or, that a lot of people know. that we had for yeah. a while. Yeah, yeah, it's got a much more natural finish, which yeah. I expect, you know, not surprised from BC Garn. I do think it's very, very wearable. And it is organic certified, organic cotton. Yeah. So we have some kits, I think, or a couple kits left for this Antioch blanket. We have these colors in stock. So if you don't see the kit, let us know that you want it. We'll put it together. Or if you want to choose your own colors. Choose your own colors. Yeah match your beach house decor, right? I mean, we've all got beach houses, right? <laughs> <laughs> we are, with the, the team are like very excited for Coastal Grandma to return this uh, this summer. So we'll all be dreaming of, of beach houses in the Hamptons. Um, next we have next. some- What sample have you got? Yeah, I've got the old that one. So we talked about knitting for olive already. Uh, but one of the yarns we make sure to bring in lots of at this time of year is the pure silk. So this is a fingering weight, 100% silk yarn in this. It's a slightly reduced palette from their Merino, but it's still very beautiful yeah. and quite, there's it, lots to choose from. It's similar in, uh, in scope to the cotton Merino palette that they have, which we could also talk about, although the, the we don't have the sample, sample to hand. It's okay, we'll, keep, yeah. we'll stick with this one yeah. for now. Um, I love this for being that sort of like wool borette silk it is 100 percent barrette silk um without being t overly tweedy and slubby yeah. you still get a really unified knitting experience and you get like a really unified fabric at the end it's not as tweedy as like say tessa silk or other raw silk yarns um but you do definitely get a different shine drape and texture to uh, a cotton merino or uh, merino type yarn 
It's so pleasant to knit with this one. And I find it's, uh, the silk is definitely a, a whole other thing to wear mm -hmm. as well. There's this real sense that it stays cool. Mm -hmm. um, I find also it has like a certain like fresh smell to it. Yeah. I mean, I don't yeah, know if everyone totally. else can smell the smell of silk, but I find yeah. I can, especially when I'm washing and it just smells good and fresh clean and fresh. Yeah, yeah, there's something really lovely about it. So yeah, this is the Ola Top by Irene Lynn. Um, just one example of the things you could do with it, but any fingering weight t-shirt is going to be perfect. And this is size one, which is a 42.5 inch chest. There, are, um, It has a wide size span and is intended to be worn with a lot of ease, but we actually like this with a little bit less yeah. ease because it has not quite a cap sleeve. It could almost, if you wear it with less ease, it'll be like a tank. And that has a really lovely shape to it as well. Yeah. Cool. That's that. And since I mentioned it, although uh, I don't have the sample immediately to hand, we also have a really good selection at the moment of the Knitting for Olive Cotton Merino, um, which still feels really quite different from Biobalance. It's oh, yeah. finer. Um, it has more of a spin. It actually, on the shelf, we have to be careful because it looks really like the Merino and it has a very similar finish when knit up that really smooth matte unified fabric um and just really adorable colors. but it's much more cotton it's 70 percent right right good good catch yeah so yeah lots of options there for um all of jesse maid's patterns that ari and lynn like we mentioned um and yeah shawls baby stuff toys super adorable Um, next one. Oh, we have a few thicker ones to talk about. Oh, no, I'll talk about our last fingering sport rate one, and then we can move on to the chunkier ones. Okay, sure. So this is new for this year. So new, we haven't actually got a sample knit up yet. I was playing around with swatches, but I haven't been fully inspired yet. I think maybe I need to wait for the warm weather to set in. I'm also excited to see what comes out of this season's summer and spring magazines. Well, spring, yeah, spring absolutely. Spring magazines have launched, but also the summer magazines. But also all the, all the indie designers that yeah, are going to be releasing totally. probably in the next month and a bit, all their cool summer designs yeah. and stuff. So um, so this is called Brighton Beach. It's from Queensland Collection. It is a cotton and linen blend with also some acrylic. And um, the fascinating thing about it is it's color changing barber pole look. So imagine Zabable, but in a summer plant-based yarn. And show you a little bit what that texture looks like. So it has gloss to it as well. It has a little bit of shine to it and it is a bit slubbier, thick and thin than um, some of these other yarns we've been talking about. If you see there's sort of an example of how that sort of linen slub kind of comes into it. And uh, I think the color changes are quite long with this one. It is, and I think what would be really fun to do with this is some kind of slip stitch or mm -hmm. two row stripe or something like that with a solid, and it's really gonna uh, emphasize that versus, yeah. um, you know, I get it, it's not my favorite thing, but the sort of more like collage -y sort of feel when something is really, and then, and then if, especially if you're, if you're not knitting flat, if you're yeah. knitting in the round, then the pooling changes or the repeat changes, and I don't always love that. Yeah. So I like the idea of combining it with a solid, either in color work or a slip stitch. I think that's really where it's going to shine. I went to look at this yarn to see what people have done with it so far. Um, I think we've mentioned before, Queensland is a fairly new brand to us. I think they've been operating for a while, but I don't know how widespread they are in North America. Um, and a lot of the projects that used it on its own with no alternating, just stockinette, did pool in certain ways. So that's something to be aware of. And I think you can kind of use that to influence your pattern choice and work with the yarn rather than against it. Um, this has a really good yardage of oh, I'm yeah. finding it. It's 328. Oh, 328 yards in 100 grams, um, suggested 23 to 26 stitches. And Do you I think tested, that's right? I think that's right. I've been swatching it on three and 3.5 millimeter needles, which for me gets me about 22 to 24 and I tried it in color work and talking about elasticity um plant yarns are often not ideal for color work because they don't have stretch you can get these tension issues and they won't sort of relax, relax. into themselves when blocked um like wool yarns especially untreated yarns like I was talking about with the Noika sweater but the acrylic in this I think helps that so I think if you were using it with cotton merino or biobalance you would be able to get some really fun color work. Like I'm thinking yoke t-shirts. Yeah, kind of there's thing. so many beautiful patterns like that. 
but I'm really excited to use it with Sweet Georgia Flax and Silk Fine because I sw swatched that and played and that's also what I'm holding back on casting this on because I really loved the combination with this linen silk blend that we are getting back. It and hasn't again, landed yet. Silk has a little bit more, does it have a little bit more elasticity? It does. Like lend, I, yes. Lend that to the yarn at least. I do find that like as someone who finds plant-based fibers hard to knit with a, some silk content mm -hmm. in there makes a big difference for me yeah. and that it just responds a little bit more like a wool. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. I realize I, I'm the one who picked all which ones we were going to show and I totally got this palette going. <laughs> <laughs> Ta -da, da -da. Yep, it's Naomi's this palette. This is going to be sure. this summer for sure. <laughs> I actually have to be careful when I, I think I picked this one to swatch with. The other thing is I have to be careful to pick a contrast color that's going to give enough contrast and show this off. And I think that's where slip stitches can help too, because you've got, and dip stitches and things, you've got more pop. More, and also like more contrast. opportunity for the yarn to shine through as well. Yeah. So it's maybe not I'll, hidden in the strands yeah. behind. Maybe I'll go to some Moonstruck Knits Ooh. for inspiration. Yeah, so maybe mosaic. Some of, she's or... got some um, really beautiful summer patterns and tees. Love that. Yeah. So super excited about those. We'll keep you updated on progress. Um, and yeah, now we have some sort of a oxymoron, chunky summer knit. Hey, if you make the yarn, we will knit it. <laughs> so uh, this is a great sample to show off this beautiful yarn. This is the super simple summer sweater by Hohi Locatelli. And it is just that. It is gorgeously simple. If you're looking for a first sweater pattern and you like yokes, this is a great one to start with. Um, it's got an almost chunky gauge. Is it 16 stitches? Let's see what our little tag um, says. And you don't have to knit it in Mungo, but that's what Hohi used. And so she used the natural and Carval colors, which we have both in sweater quantities. 17.5. 17.5, there we go. I was off by 1.5. Um, you basically just need the same number of each, depending on your size, from about three to six balls of each color. And um, yeah, it couldn't be simpler. Um, well, the only way it could be simpler is if you weren't knitting stripes, but even the stripes are as simple as stripes ever get. You don't have to carry the yarns. Um, you just do these big color blocked chunks. And it's just got that classic sort of almost marinere, like red yeah. stripey thing without yeah. being too calling to that. Like totally. I do feel like it's really something you could just come back to year after year. The investment you make in the yarn and in the knitting time is going to get you something that you will be coming back to definitely over and over and over again. This has again. been in the store for years. People are always borrowing it in the summer to toss on again in the air conditioning. I love the little rolled hem. There's like a slight rolled hem detail at the cuff yeah, at the top and, of the, and bottom of the um, rib. I made one in the summer of 2020, I think, and it's my campfire sweater every year. I make sure to bring it wherever I'm going on holiday for those cool evenings where you want to, wool might be overdoing it, but you still want to be cozy and cuddle up in something. Um, but at least summers here in Canada, it can often just still stay well, in the evening, warm into sure. the evenings, but you want something. And this is just the best combination of cozy without overheating. And it, what is the blend on this one? It's cotton and wool. It is... Where's the percentage? 50% wool and 50% cotton. And the cotton is entirely spun, actually both the, um, the wool and the cotton are entirely spun from pre-consumer waste generated by Portuguese spinning mills. So the wool comes from Portugal and all of it comes from mill waste, which is great. That's a nice thing. That's why it's kind of like tweedy too. Yeah. yeah. And I just took these two colors in new to us this year and they're just so fun. Let's talk, yeah. That Keeping this, on my lilac this train. This lilac thing, is, um, it's all over the place. Yeah. So it's, I think this would be really just so much fun in, in, not just in this sweater, it could be any wool worsted weight sweater that you feel like wearing through the summer. Try it in this yarn. Yeah. That's that. Do you want to tell us about this one? Yeah. So this was a little bit of my coup de coeur. This is called Coastline by Jody Long. And it is quite a strange construction for a yarn. So it's got this little, I think there's a little end here I can show. So basically, you know, we, we've talked a lot about blown yarns where there's a core and then the fiber is sort of blown into it. This is not that. This does have a core, but it's almost like- um, It's a spongy I, tube. It's, it's a spongy tube. <laughs> Sounds gross, but it's not. Um, with like, I, like fiber is encircling it. So almost like um, 
No, like chow goon needles have their red cord. Mm. There's like an exterior thing that's the plasticky stuff, right, and right. inside is a wire. Okay. So imagine picturing it like that. <laughs> there's a piece inside, and then there's like a wrapped piece of fiber or that is the color. It's like braided around. Uh, braided around. There you go. That's yeah. great. And the braiding is actually striped. That's why it looks Yeah, it's muffled. got this sort of melange feel to it. Yeah. Um, but what is so cool about it is, you know, this core that it has which is clearly like some kind of not a natural thing i get that it's not it's like probably a nylon viscose combination but it gives the yarn um an elasticity and a bounce that i have not found in other plant-based yarns there it is at the end of this little swatch so here's a little swatch of it it feels as close to a sweatshirt as a hand knit is ever going to get that's it and it's so it's got this it feels this, like jersey. Yeah, it's really comfortable to yeah. knit with. It's really comfortable to wear. It has some drape from the linen cotton exterior, but it has this bounce from, from the core. So it, it knits at a kind of classic worsted weight. One of the things I was thinking about this for is our, our classic chevron baby blanket. Mm. This is a great yarn to use for that. But also, I really like the idea of using this for garments, and I'm, really, I'm planning to cast something on for myself as soon as I get my sort of like <laughs> store samples and other things. I'm feeling overloaded with my whips as usual, but this is my next thing for sure. I love the idea of maybe doing some cables or some textured knitting mm -hmm. with it. It really has dimension. So, you know, it seems like we've, we haven't knit anything for the store with it yet, and yet it's flying off our shelves. <laughs> I think other knitters knew about this and we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so we're catching up, uh, but I really, I really encourage you to give it a try, especially if you're just looking for something different. Um, I, and and all, any of this sounds interesting to you? This it's is really interesting. It's growing on me. I was skeptical about this when we first saw it, um, but I think it, would, it, it lends itself to very particular types of knits. I can imagine, like I said, sweatshirt parka knits has that um, no sweat sweatshirt hoodie yeah. that I think would be really fun in this. It, you, you would definitely get that like, wait, you made that? impact with it because it doesn't look like a hand knitting yarn i'm actually really intrigued by the black just quickly because that tube in the middle is showing through the braid and that's why the black has this really interesting dimension to it um it almost looks sparkly yeah days. yeah it's really cool yeah yeah i don't there's something about it that you want to play with it yeah it, it's and just got so that touchability the other thing that i think would be fun for it is toys i've said i'm on a toy kick because <laughs> between like the new Moosh and Friends book available now on our website to pre-order and I knit a little toy bear that I wish I could show you but I already gave it to my grandmother for her birthday and everybody died. <laughs> it was far too cute. Um, and I'm just like, ooh, toys. Yeah, I do think I this think would be great for that toys. too. Yeah. Then tied to it, you've got glimpses of this fun coral yarn. This is a cotton linen tape yarn called Sailor Man by DHG. Who's the son of a sailor? Yeah, we've been singing a lot as we play with this one. <laughs> um, this, I know that's not how it goes, by the way. Um, <laughs> this is a hundred, no, it's not even cotton and linen. My mistake, 100% cotton. The reason I think of it as linen adjacent is because it could be such a fantastic sub for Quince & Co Kestrel, which we don't stock anymore. Um, and there's, been nothing quite like it until um this so tape. again like the i find that the structure of yeah. this yarn with the braid like with the tape makes it easier for me to knit as someone who's kind of like mm -hmm. resistant to stuff that doesn't have the elasticity there is some stretch to it makes yeah. it super fun to knit it's chunky without being heavy that tape itself is made from um it effectively being i think knitted in a tube and then flattened so it does have as much stretch as a knit as fabric a knit. would have and so i'm holding it this way for the flat side of the tape and then you can see how much it narrows when you flip it on its edge so it gives a lot of texture when it's knit up i wish we'd asked andy to leave the sample but... i know so we have a sample in progress andy yeah. is knitting us the um the fabulous de shane by lila raven um and it's looking amazing and we totally forgot to ask yeah. them to leave <laughs> it for us but it will be ready soon yeah they're using this color plum um, and knitting, I think one more repeat in the body because this is cotton with a bit more bounce and linen drapes more heavily. Um, we needed one more repeat in there to give the length on that pattern. So we'll show that And soon. we'll definitely uh, make note of our mods. Of course. And then there are all these really fun, bright colors as well. So I think this is great for anything flowy, oversized, 
Coastal Grandma vibes, tunics, caftans. Bags too could be bags. really fun. Yeah. 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 We feel like we, I feel, especially just doing that, I really do feel like we have so many fun things for yeah. the warm weather. And I hope it tempts anyone out there who hasn't done warm weather knitting to give it a try. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, if you're thinking of knitting for somebody who lives in a warmer climate and you want some tips on which, you know, hopefully there's more variety for you now that the season's upon us. And if you need any tips for your own knitting or for gift knitting about what kind of yarn might be suited to projects, I know that knitting with plant fibers and choosing plant fibers for projects that might not be written for plant fibers. There's a lot of guesswork that might come into it. If you're unsure, want any sort of bolstering in your decisions, get in touch. Yeah, we're here um, to enable yeah. that. <laughs> because yeah, it's something to think about. People often ask us, can I just knit any old pattern with linen or any old pattern with cotton? And there are a few things you want to to take into account. Your row gauge usually changes, the elasticity changes, the way the fabric wears over time will change. Um, plant fibers are heavier, they'll stretch more and they won't bounce back as much as wool. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of things to take into account, but there are also really easy subs to be made. Lots of things that are released in wool yarns can be knit in plant yarns. So all sorts of options. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we're back with a big pile of bags. <laughs> yeah, we've been waiting for these for a while. Um, we're so excited to have them back in stock. This is uh, Love It from the Netherlands. Uh, these are all beautiful uh, screen printed bags. We have the uh, Pull It, which is the classic drawstring. And then we have the Zip It, which has these really cool Bold, accent zippers. Bright. Yeah, I love, I always say this when I'm talking about the Love It zippers, Zip It bags if you're worried about zippers on your bags because of catching whatever it may be um these first of all are really nice and deep this exclusive print branch, branches and buds is even deeper a little bit bigger um so first of all you, you know you can get everything down in there before you zip it but it's also just this really big teeth plastic zipper that's really sturdy but harder to get stuff caught in you know, you're not going to get it caught between the tiny little metal teeth. Yeah, they're great yeah. for that. And so, yeah, we have our classic. We did the yellow stripe. We have the black grid. This Again, is so like beach holiday to I me. I know, like, it's so beach great. Beach tents, awnings, I just I, I want to put it with my stripey sweater. Anyway, I'll deal with that later. Um, <laughs> but then we really wanted to get something fresh and new. So uh, as Naomi mentioned, we have this beautiful uh, over, like I guess double layered. Yeah, it's uh, really gorgeous effectively twice the work um ingrid has screen printed this beautiful dusty rose on first and then on top of it is this gorgeous fluorescent pinky orange and then we couldn't resist a giant tulip Absolutely i think we're just not. like we're we're just so eager to see yeah. some some color and so when we saw this we're like okay gotta have it yeah it's beautiful so, it's like kind of marimekko to me too yes. like that bold bright colorful like floral without being da like dainty it's yeah just, it's yeah i think that actually describes the whole vibe really well yeah. like it is like it's not dainty, mm -hmm. but it is bright and cheerful without also without being too whimsical. Like there's something yeah. it really nails this yeah. beautiful, happy medium. Totally. Where it like, gets all class without being. I love being... a bit of whimsy, but this is if you're not someone into sort of super dainty florals or small patterns or whatever, but you want a bit of color, this is a really fun graphic way to get it in. Especially, you know, with the zips being such fun colors, we have a couple of options in uh, black and white too but you still get a little bit of a pop of color if you want that. And then yeah. there's just even the tag on the side, it's just fun, yeah. playful. I love them. And so we just um, did some changes in the store where we were moving things around and now we have this beautiful like wall of these bags and it just like makes you smile when you come in and see it. Yeah. First of all, many of you may be aware, 52 Weeks of Socks, volume two. Ooh, we're using the front facing camera. So these may be flipped for you, I realize, because I flipped it, so I'm looking at this. Uh, you know, do we think everyone can handle it? I think people can handle I it. I think you can handle it. We will lay, we will write it out <laughs> properly at the bottom, but we'll keep that in mind for next time. Skew 25. <laughs> Skew four. Yeah, 52 Weeks of two Socks, more. Volume 2. two. Um, much anticipated uh, second volume of these of this beautiful series. And uh, how many patterns? Are there? Well, 52. I, I can't believe I had to ask that out loud. There's 52. <laughs> So one thing we noticed in um, this book is how much color work there is, which is really fun because color work socks, they're a little bit of extra work, but 
the results can be so satisfying and creative. So this is a pair, hang on, I should, I should check the name. Joy, Joyce, she's sweet. And these two colors immediately jumped to mind for it. This is our happy four ply in uh, rosewood and summer peach. Yeah, it couldn't be more perfect. And then I have it ready because then I noticed how perfect these two are together. And this one's for called Louis. Peacock and Summer Peach. And that's why I love reading through big compendiums like this. Just the inspiration you get for pairing different colors together. And Absolutely. You look at your stash, you look at your own, and it helps you just look at your yarn in a whole different way. I never would have paired Summer Peach and Peacock together. And they're not exactly the same as the yarns you used, obviously, but it just made me think of it. And now I want to use these two together. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool patterns in here, but I would definitely say color work is a key theme running through it. It's not all color work, but even sometimes just like a contrasting toe and heel. Yeah. But I love that, you know, especially coming out with a second volume, that there's some good challenges in here for people who maybe uh, actually knit the 52 patterns from the first one. That's there's true. Some good stuff or maybe here. 52 weeks of socks, the first volume like got you into sock knitting, or maybe you knit your first pair from that. There, ha there were some really lovely intro patterns in there as well as more skillful ones. And then this is a level up your game. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Yeah. So that's beautiful. We also have a new book of patterns from a local designer to us, Gabrielle Vezina. And I first met Gabrielle when I was dying with uh, Humble Knit. Uh, we did a collaboration together for the Twist X series, which is an um, initiative that the Twist Festival here in Quebec in Montebello, uh, Saint-André-Avalon, um, put together to match local dyers and designers. So um, she came up with an absolutely gorgeous pattern that was absolutely fully on the brief. Like she got my aesthetic, she got the vibe of Humble Knit, um, both my colors and what I like to knit. And it was just a really great pairing of dyer and designer I found. Um, I'll give Steph the link to pop in the caption Ooh, when yes. she's editing so that I can show you, you can see the shawl that she did that resulted from that. All that to say, um, I've admired her work ever since. And she's become a real um, expert in lace designing. And that is what this book, Lovely Lace Knits, focuses on. Um, oof. She brought this sample to our trunk show and the bubbles were perfection. I've never seen such good and consistent bubbles and she's, she gives the technique in this. I haven't followed it yet, but I think there's a video tutorial link to it as well. This as well. So, and then, you know, it's not, what I like about it is it's not all tiny fingering mm -hmm. weight or lace weight, like mm -hmm. really expert use of pairing the texture with the right weight. This is Gilead and uh, yeah, we, we sent her the yarn for this and she's made something so Oh, that makes me feel so it. good. It's the color Berlin Bleu and I think it has to be a store sample next autumn. All right, excellent. Yeah. So yeah, we um, we also hosted like a little launch for this along mm. with our knit night and it was really cool to be able to get behind it yeah. in a big way and uh, we're really excited to see people's knits start to develop from yeah. this book. So this is 16 patterns, um, a range of yarn weights, uh, mostly um, garments, adult garments and accessories, a, a few socks, a cute little hat, a couple of hats, I think, and shawls. So really something for, for everybody in a great little format. Yeah. And then just quickly, um, we've sort of expanded our ethos in terms of picking books because we just decided to get more of the stuff we like to read. Um, we've got a few, well, the trilogy of Clara Parks is excellent readable. Uh, books, Knitland Knitlandia, Vanishing Fleece, and A Stash of One's Own, um, all about, in various ways, um, textiles, knitting, textile industry, wool production industry, um, if you're interested in any of that sort of contextual wool craft type reads. These basically are book-length blogs, so readable, so fun, um, and you just learn so much. Yeah, absolutely. And part of the inspiration for bringing in more of these books was on our trip to New York, um, we went to the uh, Tenement Museum where they have an incredible mm. gift shop, which is mostly books. And they're super specialized in sort of social history and you get to sort of see history through a lens. And it really made us go, well, why don't we have those kinds of books about knitting and fabrics and textiles? So we, we did some looking around to find stuff and we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. But this is one that's proven very popular. Not so much knitting related, but it's just a book about the color red. 
I and love it's that. about the dyeing and about yes. like the value we place on certain colors and all yeah. of that history. Um, so much more of a, a novel, I would, or not novel, yeah. but like a big read compared to the Clara Park stuff. Yeah. Like really fun. Creative nonfiction. Yeah. Very much so. Um, but not still like more in the readable, popular side of things. It's not an academic text, um, although it's clearly extremely well researched and it's focused on, um, on cochineal, really, the yeah. history of, of this dye. Um, so if you have any suggestions for books like this that you think we'd love to see, please do let us know. We're aware of very many more than we actually have. It's a mission dealing with publisher suppliers yeah. is totally different <laughs> from dealing with yarn suppliers. Mona has become very skilled at sourcing, like working her way, backtracking through all the different publishing well because like every country they have a different uses. agreement and so it's like it yeah, can be a little like the, tough yeah it has nothing to do with the author and it barely often has anything to do with the publisher you have to find the distributor of that subsidiary of, of that, that publisher. publisher yeah um so but we're on the hunt and so we'd love to also hear your recommendations for anything textile related anything any reads that you've loved um we're far too disorganized to start a book club but like, <laughs> imagine <laughs> yeah so lastly something quite relevant again to the season we wanted to chat about. You've been doing a lot of this lately. Yeah, about sort of washing and blocking your knits, which are actually surprisingly almost the same thing. Um, you know, it's funny because we, you know, we tend to see in patterns things like, oh, and now block. And to newer knitters or and people who are coming new to the craft, they're like, well, what is that? It really mostly means to wash whatever you just made in the way that you will wash it again in the future. Uh, sometimes when it's something you're not going to wash frequently, it also means pinning things out, trying to get it to the, to the actual measurements that either the schematic calls for or that whatever your pattern tells you to. Um, but the main thing is to, to get it either wet or to steam it. But in this case, um, sort of talking about spring, one of the things I'm doing, I have like bins and bins at our doorway of all our hats and mittens and scarves, and they've been used all winter and it's time to like hopefully start putting them away. And before I do that, I like to give them a good wash. So uh, we have a number of, well, we have basically two main brands that we go to. We have Soak and we have Eucalan, and both of these are no rinse wool washes. So that means that you don't have to do an extra step. You can put this in with your water, agitate or not, depending on what you're blocking or washing. Uh, and then you don't have to do with the second thing where you rinse it out. Mm -hmm. So there's less agitation, less work involved. Yeah. It has a light scent unless you get the unscented one, not heavy at all. Um, so we go through this a lot uh, at home. So one of the things I'm doing is just trying to like clean everything up before the end of the year. So yeah. I actually bought myself a tiny little washing machine and we put this on Instagram a little while ago. I tried really hard to like film what I was doing with one hand. I need a GoPro for this. Um, so basically at this point now, I have so many knitted things from all these years that I was getting really lazy uh, about keeping them clean. So I got myself a little, a little tiny washing machine that doesn't have an agitator. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing. If you're hand washing, mm -hmm. you, know, you should be hand washing as much as possible. If you can't handle that anymore, if you're lucky enough to have a washer that doesn't have an agitator, you may be able to move into the delicate cycle. What do you think about that? Would you do it? So um by agitated do you mean the like big spiral the big thing, thing in, in the middle the yeah. yeah yeah so i don't i think one time i was trying to shrink something slightly so i put it through a delicate cycle it was loft it did not shrink at all <laughs> <laughs> good for loft brooklyn tweed loft um but i do not ever put my hand knits through a full cycle in the machine because i have a second hand i don't know how many years old top loading washing machine with very little options for changing settings. Um, but I have successfully used it on the delicate spin cycle for getting water out of garments once I've soaked them. So when I wash my knits, when I'm saying washing now, effectively it's the same process you do when you first block it because you should, as Steph said, always do that first block on your fresh knit, um, the, the way it's going to be treated so you know how it'll behave. That said, do as I say and not as I do. Often I'm like uh, <laughs> impatient and I just steam. And then when it comes to the end of the season and I really need to actually freshen the knit up, then I will wash it. So for example, I didn't wet block this stranded with mohair. I don't usually bother, but after a season of wear, if I want to freshen it up, um, well, no, I, I will want to freshen it up. And then I would 
soak it in tepid water with a little bit of this, like a capful. Um, I particularly, if I want to do that, I particularly like squeeze the soapy water, just squeezing into particularly the underarm area and the back of the neck area <clears throat> where the knit will have been most in contact with your skin, with sweat, with oils, um, especially after a season of wearing a heavy coat over our sweaters. Yeah. Um, and then I let it sit like you would for blocking about 20 minutes, half an hour. If you leave it longer because you completely forget, that's totally fine. <laughs> and if I were really good and careful, I would put them in laundry bags before putting them in the spin cycle of the machine. I'm just too lazy to get laundry bags so far, but I'm inspired by your efforts and how beautiful the results are. And I'm going to do a laundry effort this season once it's warm enough that I can lay them flat on my balcony to dry. Yeah, I will say um, I'm still learning about my little machine that I got. Um, you know, some things still I think I'm learning shouldn't go in there. Mohair. Okay. Um, I did put one in there where I feel like it was it had just some mohair at the top on its own and mm. then was stranded in the rest. And at the top where it was on its own, I feel like it it, it shrank uh, a uh, little bit. Why you say that? Because I usually just steam my mohair knits when I've done with them. I haven't actually ever put mohair knits through the delicate spin cycle of my I think I would just squeeze those out but that one I did yeah and, and this really it down with up. anything it's like it adds more it, it like folded yeah it, it raised up the the neck so yeah so neck. obviously there's a little bit of um yeah sort of trial and error there and it's the scariest trial and error when you've knit something adorable and wonderful yeah. and you put all your effort into it and then you put that mohair thing in the machine and you yeah. it comes out and you're like oh I shouldn't have done Ultimately, that. Ultimately if you're worried about the results you don't have to put it in the machine ever. Take no. a little bit of extra time um, so, you know wrap it in another an extra towel to get all of the moisture out as, you, as much as you can. Um, I think it was Andrea Maori I read this tip from doesn't leave the knits to dry on the towel which makes total sense because the towel's damp it is underneath wet. it's going to hold that dampness. Put it on a, a bin bag or a plastic sheet Oh, that's really smart. Well, I also you can get these things... like um, mesh sort of. Yeah, I have one of those. I have one, and I it, you can get some that are like that's stacked. stacked. One, I have one that hangs. It's cool. I just don't have anywhere to hang it because it's this big, big. wide disc, yeah. and then the hook is in the middle, and I don't have any like freestanding pole anywhere <laughs> to like, <laughs> latch it onto. So it's always at an angle. Anyway. I, I do things when I can dry them out outside. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I, what's nice about okay. so this machine that I got also has a spin dryer. Mm. So imagine a salad spinner, mm. but like that plugs in and that you can fit four sweaters into. That I don't have any fear about using. Right. So you know, if you have any fear about washing in the machine, that's fair. You know, like I said, I took my risk and I lost that game. But in terms of drying mm. a spin. Even you could use a salad spinner to help you get water out. It's really, yeah. really effective and it's not going to damage what you knit. So that's effectively the philosophy I took when I tried the delicate spin cycle on my top loading washing machine. If you have a front loader, I think even less risk. Yeah. There, yeah. Especially with the laundry bag. Um, but why do we wash our knits at the end of the season? Well, one of the things you talked about is like the oils and, you know, skin and stuff like that. Mm. And eventually it's going to start to smell a little funny. Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing, but also just it's so much easier to do it now yeah. than when you get it out later. And you just want to wear it. So this is like definitely a case yeah. of like be kind to your future self. Yeah. Um, you know, and take the time, especially as it's starting to get warmer out, yeah. it, that you can dry stuff outside because by the time you pull that hat, that mm -hmm. scarf out in October, you're not going to want to do it. Totally. Um, so it's nice to just store everything clean. It's yeah. good. It protects it from moths and things like that too. So exactly. like you get everything nice and clean, you can put it away. And discoloration too. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's also a good way to kind of assess, is there anything that didn't make it through the season? Is there something that True. needs mending? Yeah. It's just that spring cleaning yeah. feeling too that I get. And if you knit lace and cables and things with texture and shape especially you know we're talking about sweaters but you should we, you should do this for shawls too because they're around your neck too and the other thing with shawls is they're often the sorts of things that we actually block as in pinning and all of that type of thing more um sort of intentionally and, um, and yeah and i think sometimes and, the question is people are like oh do you mean i have to pin it again it's like yeah well you don't have to but the thing is as as we've all seen Blocking makes, say, points and lace really crisp and open, but the wool is going to bounce back and take and lose that shape a little bit over the season as you wear it. So when you wash it, why not also take the time 
to pin it and get it back to its best and then fold it away and it'll be perfect when you open it up the next season. So that's why I'm holding this cute little package of Walcott wires. This is an adorable, friendly, travel friendly little container case. I'm not going to unwrap all the wires because they're so beautifully tied together, but it contains a bunch of really flexible, great wires for getting crisp, straight edges, but also curved edges. And then um, pins as well, classic T pins. I don't know if you can see them through the paper um, and some instructions. Um, so this is the, we've had blocking tools at the store in the past. We even have a bucket of them over there that are they're really huge. unwieldy. They're, yeah, they're really Think like big. three foot long, effectively like God, the sorts of things you raise beams up in your garden <laughs> and, and really awkward to store. And these just, this just eliminates that issue. So if you do a lot of lace work, shawls, this is a really good kit to have. And I, like you said, it's not just for curves. There's a really, these are these work great for straight lines as well. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah. this is your, this is your PSA to reblock your knits before you put them away for the season. They'll last longer. They'll be fresher when you open them up. It, I don't wash my knits through the season. I don't have a heavy rotation of like wearing the same sweaters often, often, often. Um, and wool is self-cleaning, antimicrobial, all that stuff we hear about the great properties of wool. But you still want to wash it at least once a season, anything in wool, I would say, even more so in superwash and even more so in, in um, yeah. synthetic blends. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I get that wool is self-cleaning, but I don't think it can clean salad dressing off itself. No, that is That's true. why I have to wash mine all Although, the time. Although, didn't your um, black sea sweater in a... Uh, Ooh, yes, I have quite the story about that. Yeah. So I, I knit this beautiful cable sweater in like an off-white tone of Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. Uh, I think I've worn it on the podcast. And, it has like uh, a high little neck and yeah. a beautiful center cable. So I was wearing it, I think, for the first or second time. And a glass of red wine went right down the front. And I thought, that's it. Like, it's totally ruined. But that wool, it was so good at sort of being so... I don't know what the property of it is. It's hydrophobic. <laughs> yes. But basically just pressing a cloth yeah. against it took everything out you would never know this Wild. ever happened like it never is know. pristine so that was kind of a huge wake-up call of like if it's good quality wool mm -hmm. uh you know it can last and it can it, it protects itself from stains somehow miraculously yeah but um you know if you drag your sleeve through your food all the time you're gonna need to wash your knits <laughs> and um unsponsored and we don't stock this but blue dawn is the best grease remover for textiles i've yeah, for that, those spot cleans. Spot cleans. Um, even I had like randomly, I think it's because I lent it to my sister, but one of my sweaters had like randomly, I don't know what, like a large shadow of something. And I couldn't tell if it was something in the yarn or what. Blue Dawn. Took it right took out. It right out. Even days later, like I've been traveling and like dropped yogurt on something. And then four or five days later after that stain has set in, I come back and I just leave some Blue Dawn on it. Gone. Okay, that so. actually now I have a project for when I yeah. get home because I have something that has a the shadow stain. I know yeah. what you're talking about. You're like, yeah. is it there? If I yeah, and then you're like, no, there, there's definitely something there. Yeah, it's probably salad dressing. Better than a tide stick. They should make a blue dawn stick. Maybe this could be our next venture. <laughs> uh, I think that's everything. Is there anything else we want to say about blocking? I'll I'll say this. Okay, if blocking is intimidating to you. Just don't let it be. It really is just, as my husband calls it, fancy laundry. <laughs> like, if you can wash clothes, you can block. And don't let anybody convince you that it's more complicated than that. It really is. It's definitely hand washing, mm -hmm. and it means being careful. But if, if you've ever washed, I don't know, a bra, a baby, you can do this. <laughs> it's easier than washing a baby. Much easier. You just have to squeeze. Don't squeeze the baby. <laughs> So anyway, I hope that helps. And of course, if you have any questions about blocking or anything, you can you can always write to us and we'll give you our uh, the benefit of our hive mind here. Uh, well, that about wraps it up. Yeah. yeah. But a happy spring. It's a very springy spring. podcast and yeah. we're looking forward to our next episode where we'll have some spring knits to show. Hopefully. <laughs> well, certainly, yes, because we'll have at least the dishing yeah. and some other some other lovely things coming in. We didn't even talk about Zooey, for example. Oh, yeah, which we yeah. do have a restock of. So we'll show those. We'll get to showing those samples next Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Okay. There's a lot more warm weather to come. Yay. Thanks well, for tuning in. And in the meantime, happy knitting. Happy knitting. <laughs>